memory of those who died. Well, I think people are so fed up with the whole thing. Look at those crosses. There's 878 of them. These uh, represent people who have died. People who have died. And um, then there's um, 10 and a half thousand people have been injured, some of them maimed for life. I think the tragedy really for us, um, as I see it, uh, it probably sounds strange to say this, but today uh, the potential murderers of tomorrow are being made murderers because of hardline attitudes. And I think when people hold these attitudes, they must realize that the end product of a man who is going to hold out for what he wants and never see the other person's point of view, the end product is another cross to this line to go right round the city hall. This is the end product. 1973 was also a year marked by terrorism, hijackings, letter bombs, kidnapping, a year of war, the Americans withdrawing from Vietnam, going into Cambodia for a time, war breaking out in the Middle East. There was continuing violence in Northern Ireland, Belfast, Dublin, and London. All were cities which made world headlines during the year as places where terrorists using car bombs offered casual violence. And I hate to see my London being blown to pieces. Belfast, Dublin and London were also noted for their political initiatives during 1973. The initiatives, new policies, new thinking came from many sides during what many will see as a constructive year. A year, in short, more noted for its politics than for its violence. Outside Ireland and within this island, the politics of the possible was being attempted. The crunch issues are hard and they're right in front of us and there's no way of walking around those, there's no shortcuts. In a ceasefire agreement, we, neither party should be asked to give up its basic positions on the overall settlement. That is a matter on which they must commit themselves to the fortune of negotiation. Did you have to settle for less than you wanted? Yes, we looked for more, but one usually looks for more. Very easy to shout sell out and Twitter, but it's not as easy to try to bring forward an, an alternative. If it's to be a coalition, there has to be a certain amount of give and take. We argue about it, we discuss it, and naturally some compromises must be made, there's no question about that. Politics is the art of the possible. It was a year which opened quietly enough. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, that I will faithfully execute... The previous November, Richard Nixon was re-elected for a second term in a landslide. ...and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve and protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. In his inaugural speech in January, President Nixon talked of the American exit from Vietnam. Because of America's bold initiatives, 1972 will be long remembered as the year of the greatest progress since the end of World War II toward a lasting peace in the world. The American public tended to equate their exit from Vietnam with peace, but neither peace nor political stability came to Vietnam itself during 1973. Nevertheless, church bells rang out across America on the day that the formal peace agreement was signed and when the prisoners of war came home. We are profoundly grateful to our Commander-in-Chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. January also saw Brian Lenehan as the new Minister for Foreign Affairs facing up to his responsibilities as one of the Council of Ministers of the EEC during the months and the year ahead. Well, we've been discussing the priorities already. Uh, first of all, we have to, uh, in, in the next 12 months, uh, uh, make sure that we are thoroughly involved in the proposals taken by the European Economic Commission in which we are very interested, such as the a common market agriculture policy, we want to see that strengthened, of course, and also the regional development policy that is as yet in a very embryonic stage. We want to see this advanced. And the Reverend Ian Paisley was concerned at what he saw as a strengthening of the ecumenical movement. Well, of course, I'm against monopolies, uh, uh, all sorts of monopolies. And I think that uh, 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 if there was one world church, that it would essentially be a persecuting church. And I have seen the, the persecuting persecution complex in the ecumenical movement uh, when they have attempted, for instance, uh, 
I have a, a, a service in the uh, in, in the Crumlin Road prison, and uh, uh, the people that attend that service are, are as much entitled to use the chapel in that prison uh, than anybody else. And yet, uh, because of the chaplains uh, uh, being very sore that I should even be permitted to preach inside the prison, uh, they won't cooperate in any way to allow me to have my service in, in, in that particular place. Not that I mind, because we have another suitable place, but it's just one of the examples. Do you think the Protestant churches in the north of Ireland fear your influence and fear the growth of your particular church? <laughs> I, I certainly think they do. And in the early part of the year, war was declared against the United States of America. We do consider ourselves under attack and at war with the United States of America. We are asking that all concerned freedom-loving countries of the world aid us in our struggle for independence. A group of American Indians lobbying for a fairer deal and no discrimination at an historic place, Wounded Knee. February brought an Irish general election, and with the British white paper in Northern Ireland expected shortly and the Fianna Fáil majority in the Doyle eroded, Taoiseach Jack Lynch decided to go to the country. The government of the people of Ireland will, in the crucial years ahead, not only have, but be seen to have the full authority of the Irish people in the many vital issues that will face us in the coming months and in the coming years. They're the pride of the young boys that I'm glad to see here and the young ladies of their vote on the 28th of February. I, why, I do you think, why do you think that you were deprived of a vote? Simply because I think that Fianna Fáil had another trick up their sleeves. There were so many extra votes which they obviously felt they wouldn't get and they decided to get rid of us. I would like to point out to you that the uh, Taoiseach couldn't wait two months till April the 15th on a number of counts. Uh, more particularly, uh, the reason, uh, the position of his majority in Dáil Éireann uh, had been eroded uh, by a defection on the one hand, on the one hand and by ill health on the other. I'm doing a tour of the, as far as I can of the country. I have a very small car, needless to remark, and it's <coughs> very difficult to get around. Let it go out from here that we demand in the name of our people here in this constituency that even between now and the election of a new government, that the government now in office, and they still are in office, taking care of things uh, until a new one is elected, that they make the demand on Britain to declare her intention to go, that's number one, and is the primary uh, uh, line that we must ask. One of the greatest and most important planks in our platform will be achieved in the lifetimes of many people here, namely the reunification of our country. Here, 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 here. achievement must be uh, arrived at in a non-violent and peaceful manner and I think Jack Lynch represents that. The Cruz O'Brien line, if followed by an Irish government, would certainly not bring peace in the north. It would place those who have given moral leadership to the minority in the north in an impossible position and would enhance the standing of men of violence on both sides. They will be trying to distract attention from that by talking about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland shouldn't be an issue in this election. It shouldn't be. They're trying to suggest it is. But in fact, all the main political parties are in favour of peace and reconciliation. And our record, the record of both coalition parties, is in fact better on that than the Fianna Fáil record. Let them not tell us that we're security risks. The general election was unique in Irish political history. For the first time, opposition groupings had decided on a coalition pact with published policies during the election campaign itself. Liam Cosgrave, leader of Fine Gael, and 30 years in the Doyle, with only three years as a minister and three as a parliamentary secretary, as his experience of government during that time, joined Labour leader Brendan Corish in outlining coalition policies. We have taken what we believe are realistic steps to provide an alternative, to put clearly before the people what our proposals are uh, on things such as the maintenance of law and order on the north of Ireland, on social matters, on economic matters, on prices, uh, on pensions, on the position of orphans, on the position of women, on a variety of topics. We've put down clearly what we're going to do. That represents an agreed program and on that basis we're going to ask the people for authority to provide a new government that will implement these proposals. 
One of the features of the election, a general awareness that the redrawn constituency boundaries, redrawn by Kevin Boland as a Fianna Fáil minister before the 1969 election, might make a critical difference this time. Yes, yes, yes. You, you might say to a certain extent that, um, that uh, the constituencies were built up uh, on the basis of the existing deputies, existing Fianna Fáil deputies. Mr. Boland's prediction about the effects of his constituency revision in the 73 election. If the people are susceptible to swing, um, a very slight swing could bring a, a very substantial change. And so it proved. It was just um, a bit of uh, ill luck in a few constituencies. On election night, Garrett Fitzgerald's comment. If anyone may feel uh, that the result really isn't justice because they didn't lose votes with the last seats, but I regard it as po poetic justice because it is, of course, the effect of the 1969 gerrymander, which was this extraordinary kind of gerrymander, a one-election gerrymander. And I believe that Kevin Boland told the government at the time that it wouldn't stand the test of time. And of course it hasn't. And because they hadn't got the majority to put through another gerrymander, they had to face the election with an out-of-date gerrymander, which rebounded on them. And I'm very happy it did. I think that kind of crookedness deserves um, the kind of reward it's got. A belated reward four years later, but very timely. When Mr Cosgrave addressed the Doyle as Taoiseach two weeks later, he suggested that following press comment about the talent he had available for his cabinet, he said that he felt lucky to have a place on the team himself. I think that we um, had really no difficulty. Most of the people were self-evident. The uh, appointments uh, in a great many cases were anticipated. Not all in the offices in which they're in, but uh, they were certainly anticipated. And I suppose, like every government, there were some surprises in it. Uh, I will say this, that as politicians, that if there is a choice, a, a fair choice, between doing it one way which will help the coalition and in a way which will not help the coalition, naturally, I will be uh, inclined to give the benefit to the coalition. James Tully was named as Minister for Local Government. One of the tasks which preoccupied him during the year was the necessary redrawing of constituency boundaries. But I will not deliberately carve up the constituencies for the purpose of uh, simply gaining uh, political uh, kudos for the coalition. And already, I think, the Anglo-Irish relationship has changed its character. Gareth Fitzgerald was named as Minister for Foreign Affairs. Because I think most people now, now recognise, even subconsciously, that whereas for so many centuries Britain had an interest in Ireland, an interest of her own, pursued that interest, very often without much concern for Irish interests, obviously, that perhaps there is a recognition in Britain, in the political level, in both political parties, amongst the people, that Britain really has no interest in Ireland, and her only interest is to, to tidy up and wind up the unhappy aspects of that relationship and to find a solution, help us to find a solution to this problem. I think the fact that that's becoming recognised by people here means that the whole relation between Ireland and Britain is changing and changing for the good. But of course, there are, there's a difficult period ahead. We have to we will have negotiations with Britain and with the emerging institutions in Northern Ireland to, to redefine this whole relationship. Um, it's, a, it's certainly going to be difficult, but there exists now goodwill on both sides, which really hasn't existed since uh, about 1169 AD. We don't think the NESC will solve any problems. That's not its function. Richie Ryan, Minister for Finance. During the year, he set up the National Economic and Social Council. But it will have the opportunity to discuss problems and to temper the expectations of people in limited sectors. When I threw this idea uh, out in the Doyle and I put it forward there. The Minister for Posts and Telegraphs, Dr. Conor Cruz O'Brien, on All Island Broadcasting. Uh, I did so in order to test opinion at this time, uh, to see whether I would have public opinion behind me in trying to move in that general direction. Prisons will always have to be secure, there's no doubt about that. Patrick Cooney, Minister for Justice. But in addition, and along with that, there can be an emphasis on reform, reforming the prisoner and rehabilitating him to take his place in society on the conclusion of his sentence. Controls like this are never popular. They were understood and they were accepted in wartime. Justin Keating, Minister for Industry and Commerce. But when your prices are rising at 10 or 11 percent a year, which is what is happening currently, I know that the consumers want this sort of control. We had to fight very hard over a long period, and uh, eventually support was forthcoming all round. Mark Clinton, Minister for Agriculture, spent much of the year haggling and bargaining over the common market's common agricultural policy. Obviously, if there's going to continue to be a surplus of butter, 
in Europe. That's not going to help anybody. And we must recognize that uh, perhaps quick, quicker than most people because we are depending on agriculture, mainly, uh, if we are going to get the maximum advantage from our membership of EEC. Bias, of course, everyone is subject to bias. Dick Burke, Minister for Education, on bias in the teaching of history in Irish schools. I'm subject to bias, my teachers were, and probably teachers after me. Uh, every human being, to some extent, suffers from this. The main aim, I think, should be, though, to, to combat this non-culpable uh, uh, bias which everybody finds in his own being, and to work very hard at it, uh, with a view to placing before the children uh, different points of view about a particular issue. Certainly they were not being brought in here to shoot ducks. Patrick Dunnigan, Minister for Defence, on the arms which were taken off the gun-running ship Claudia. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a law and order government, this is a law and order state, this is a democracy, and we're going to be a good modern democracy that will do our job. 99% of the people in this country want law and order, and we're going to give it to them. For the two political parties which have dominated Irish politics for decades past, the Fianna Fáil Party and the Ulster Unionist Party, 1973 was a year of profound change. On election night, Jack Lynch, bowing out as Taoiseach, joined RT Radio's election special. One often hears it suggested around Leinster House that you feel perhaps that you've done your stint in public life and that you carried the burden at its worst time and that your greatest wish now perhaps is to retire to private life and that that might happen in the next year or two years. Is that your situation? Oh, so nobody knows what's going to happen in a year or two years. I know that I've had a tough time, but um, I keep going as long as I, I think I'm going to be of any use. I don't like to suggest that uh, when anybody likes a quiet life, and um, I like a quiet life as well as anybody else. Are you very unhappy tonight, Tishuk? No, indeed I'm not, no. I'm, I'm too used to victory and defeat. I've, all my life, even before I came into politics, I've been playing in what I thought were very important games then, and um, I think I accepted my defeats without bitterness, and um, I accepted victory without uh, throwing over anybody else. I took things as they came. Mr Lynch, uh, what do you see as the main and most immediate role of being a foil in opposition? Well, to get the, gov the existing government out. <laughs> Mr Lynch, <laughs> on that note, I don't think we can end on a better, more realistic <laughs> note than one true politician talking there. Thank you very much, Stacia, for joining us. Thank you and very much. later in the year, Jack Lynch raised some doubts about his continued leadership of the Fianna Fáil party. He then quelled those doubts. For Ulster Unionists and Ulster Loyalists, the British White Paper on the Future of Northern Ireland had very serious and, to some, baffling implications. Uh, well, now, I think I, like, in common with most people at this moment, um, I'm trying to... Um, interpret this somewhat opaque document. I've had a wet towel around my head for the last two hours, yes, so I have read it. They have reduced us to second-class citizenship. Uh, the document is certainly a constructive document. What, what is it, in your view? Was it half a parliament? Oh, it's specifically called an assembly. It seems to me very much a parliament because, in fact, it's going to have virtually the same powers as the old Northern Ireland parliament. I believe that the way to resist this is by the normal political and democratic means. I think it's quite wrong for anyone to try and oppose it by violent means. And therefore my attitude is that we as the loyalist people in Northern Ireland should fight these elections and win, and then tell the British government what our views are for the future government of Northern Ireland through the new elected assembly. Uh, there are two terminals in this. One is uh, total integration. Now this way quite uh, manifestly appears to be blocked at this moment. It appears to be blocked. Mm -hmm. And John Taylor nods in agreement, so does Martin Smith. I think we all accept this. Yeah, John uh, Taylor... So the, wh where is the other way? Are we going to remain static? It's clearly this is only envis 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 envisaged as an interim situation. So we've really got to think fundamentally ahead. Where are we going here? In America, the dollar was devalued during the year, as was the credibility of the American presidency. Richard Nixon had wanted his presidency to be a series of firsts. He'd be the first U.S. president to visit China, the first to establish a permanent detente with Russia. This year, he achieved an unenviable collection of firsts. The first president to have to assure the nation with emphatic candor that he was not, after all, a crook. The first holder of the office to have to get rid of his vice president because he was suddenly revealed to be a tax evader. The first to see his chief law officer charged in court with criminal offences. And that was only the beginning to the sordid Watergate affair. Richard Nixon, in 1973, had a lot of explaining to do. The easiest course would be for me to blame those to whom I delegated the responsibility to run the campaign. But that would be a cowardly thing to do. 
I will not place the blame on subordinates, on people whose zeal exceeded their judgment and who may have done wrong in a cause they deeply believed to be right. Nixon's own accounts didn't always tally. First he knew nothing about the whole affair, then he did but took no action. Then he was sorry he hadn't acted sooner. Then he ditched most of his top advisors, including former presidential aide John Dean. It is my honest belief that while the president was involved, that he did not realize or appreciate at any time the implications of his involvement. And I think that when the facts come out, I hope the president is forgiven. Did you at any time tell the president anything you knew about uh, the White House horrors? No, sir, I did not. Did the president at any time ask you what you knew about Watergate? Not after that first discussion that we had on the telephone, I believe it was on June 20th. Well, if the cat hadn't had any more curiosity than that, they'd still be enjoying this nine lives, all of them. <laughs> And in the middle of the Watergate hearings, an obscure FBI man mentioned that the White House had tape recorded some of the key and disputed conversations. There it seemed the matter might end. It could be shown now whether the president was telling the truth or not. Richard Nixon thought differently. First, he revealed that three of the most important tapes never existed. Then he refused to hand the remainder over. And when the Watergate prosecutor and the new attorney general dissented, there was a precedent for that too. They were fired. And when the tapes, the remaining tapes, were eventually played, well, some of them were inaudible. Some had the crucial part scrubbed. Richard Nixon did not get a good press in America in 1973. I have never heard or seen such outrageous, vicious, distorted reporting in 27 years of public life. At the end of the year, the president got himself a new deputy, Gerald Ford, by all accounts a simple but honest politician. Richard Nixon went on television and assured the American nation that he was not a crook. The American people seem still undecided whether they'll believe him or not. In Ireland during the year, Eamon de Valera retired from the presidency. If I'm elected by the people, it's my determination to be a president of this nation and for all the people that comprise this nation. Tom O'Higgins, the national coalition candidate for the presidency. Most of the commentators regarded him as the favourite. In fact, the election was won by the Fianna Fáil candidate Erskine Childers TD, a remarkable candidate in a remarkable campaign. And so, I propose, if I'm elected president, to inspire what I would call, in a general way, social patriotism. <laughs> And so, I will be one of the younger generation. Is that the worst of them? He was a good man, Mr. Chalper, uh, being a minister. Uh, well, but he, has, he has been a man of good integrity. And I, I think he would make the same kind of president as he was a minister. Uh, to a point dictatorial. And if I was to start to tell you about what's going to be one of the great problems of the age, and emerging already in England and America, job boredom. Job boredom comes from a better educated group of people going in to do work which inevitably, it appears, for the next quarter of a century is largely repetitive. And they've already discovered that even though men may be asked to change their jobs in a factory and do other kind of work, and even although the industrial relations in the factory is perfect, one of the advancing psychoses in our life today is the beginning of job boredom. The combination, Mr. Childers, uh, portrays not a very modern image and the modern idea of a bus cavalcade, I think, is a very good combination. It's the nicest bus I've ever been on. If they want to call it a wanderly wagon, they can. It's just the presidential bus. It's a matter of a face, I think, really, you know. I like the look of them. So good ideas, yeah, and to get on well with people, you know. It's good to see you now coming around, chatting to everybody, you know, I like to see that. I suppose politics to me is rather like gardening. I'm very fond of gardening. And when you're a politician, you have a garden to cultivate and you get enormous satisfaction if you can see the plants grow satisfactorily and you have your difficulties when they die, and when the weeds come up. But that to me is the joy of politics. And I, I don't think I've ever come across anyone in my life who's got such a versatile brain. But I told you I'd been abroad and and I've studied the social and the political history of every country in Europe. 
and I've been to America, and having allowed for all the known imperfections of Irish character, including those so well reflected in the more caustic Abbey Theatre plays, having allowed for the imperfection of our social welfare services and of the things that have yet to be done by the government before we've reached the dizzy level of the Swedish people and have it all completely arranged and organized. And allowing for that, I still say, this is the loveliest little country on God's living earth. Both presidential candidates had promised to expand the role of the presidency. Some misgivings on this point were expressed. Former Taoiseach John A. Costello. We have in the president a man who is, uh, to use the words of Dublin opinion in the cartoon, parked in the park with very little to do. And if he is intellectually active and uh, a man of energy and with perhaps ideas of what could and what could not be done, it may be that there would be the... A great source of potential trouble between him and the government. Some commentators, especially those outside the state, expressed surprise that a Protestant, English educated, non Irish speaking Fianna Foyle candidate should succeed Eamon de Valera as president. On the day following the election, the president elect answered telephone questions on RTE's involvement programme. But I would like to know, Mr. Childs, are you an Irishman? Of course I'm an Irishman, yes. But you were born and educated in England. Oh, yes, I was. What qualify yeah. you to be an Irishman? In my soul, in my heart, I am utterly Irish. You may note that quite a number of people have been interested in Ireland and helped Ireland who had a great deal of foreign blood in their veins. So you can think about that. Among the controversies of the year, mining. Ireland's mineral wealth. Mark Twain once said, a miner in the ground, a mine is a hole in the ground owned by a liar. There's been more money lost on mining than ever has been made. Pat Hughes of Tara Mines objecting to the government's decision to end the tax holiday on mining profits. The government's decision did not meet the demands being made by the most radical critics who wanted nationalisation without compensation. Senator Noel Brown at the Labour Party conference. You're dealing with a terribly dangerous subject here, comrades. Poor well, you dealt with this this very subject. He tried to take the wealth out of the ground and give it to the unfortunate, pauper-stricken people of his country, the hungry and the needy and the sick and the illiterate, and they shot him for it. And before that, and before that, and before that, and before that, they shot Patrice Lumumba, and in their own time, they shot Connolly. Because they, like us, they, as Connolly said, we simply want the earth. But we have had a severe shock to the confidence on which the industry is very dependent. Murrah O'Brien, for the mining industry, expressing shock at the government's decision. Mining is a wasting asset. That if you give uh, tax relief for a finite period, you get all the mineral torn out of the ground, there's a hole in the ground left at the end, and no revenues ever occur by taxation to the state. The minister responsible, Justin Keating, explained the government's policy. If you remit taxes on an industry for a 15-year period or any other period, you do it in the hope, in the anticipation of generating rapid industrial growth, and when the period of remission is over, you then become a recipient of possibly more, hopefully more, taxation revenues than you can get otherwise. Another issue during 1973, which legislators gave a little time and some thought to, was the contraception question. The doctors, the bishops and the Supreme Court judges spoke on the issue, as did many lobbyists for change. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit as if, for example, we had a medical profession in which the majority of the people uh, of the doctors belonged to a religious sect which opposed vaccination. Dr. David McConnell of Family Planning Services Limited. Family planning, advice on family planning, on genetic counselling, psychosexual problems, so forth. This whole area is an area of preventive medicine, which in other countries is recognised as tremendously important. Later in the year, the Catholic hierarchy, emphasising that any change in the law was a matter for legislators, still warned of the dangers which would follow if contraception was legalised. Cardinal Conway. It's an attempt uh, to stimulate a discussion a balanced discussion on this whole issue. It's an attempt to make quite clear uh, that the issue is not a question of the state enforcing Catholic moral teaching, that it's a question of public morality, that the real issue is what effect would a change in the law have on the quality of life 
in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, for many members of the Iraq, this will be a difficult decision. What do they do? Uh, because, of course, uh, there's powerful pressure being brought to bear uh, against the bill. Uh, and yet we also know that uh, many people uh, in the Republic regard our present laws in this matter as quite anachronistic and absurd. Government Minister Dr. Conor Cruz O'Brien, who spoke after the Bishop's statement, his personal liberal views on the question were already well known. I think they should be available for anybody who wants them, you know. Well, where large families are concerned, for people that are not able to have children and can't afford it, it should be available for those kind of people. Well, that's against the Catholic religion then, isn't it? Well, I think it should be an open thing between a husband and wife. There should be no... Uh, I think it personally should be allowed to use their own conscience. They will inevitably lose Senator Mary Robinson's comment on the bishop's intervention. If they make it a church-state confrontation, it will obscure the issue in the minds of Catholics who will think that the church lost, therefore using artificial contraceptives is all right. In December, a change in the law was made, and somewhat unexpectedly, when the Supreme Court found in favour of Mrs. McGee's claim that she had a constitutional right to import contraceptives. Any legislation the government now introduce must pay attention to this decision because it has now singled out privacy as a fundamental right the citizen has. And they cannot defeat that in any way because if they try to defeat it, that legislation in itself would be unconstitutional. Among other issues of 1973, abortion. An American priest, Father Marx, paid two well-publicized visits to this country. I'm going to show them an actual abortion. I'm going to show them slides from around the world of aborted babies and healthy babies and bring home to them the reality of abortion because I'm convinced you're going to have it here. You have it already, girls going to England. And uh, I think now is the time to educate the Irish. Other questions, should Irish farmers be liable for income tax? There has been a deafening silence from virtually all 144 members of Doyle Aaron as to whether the farmers should or should not be taxed. Who should compensate the parents of thalidomide children? You can't accept it as an act of God. It was a man-made damage that has been caused to our children. Who placed the car bombs in Dublin? Two Irishmen died in Dublin as a result of terrorism from Britain. You have... There is, that is completely and absolutely untrue. And you have no evidence of it whatever. You have no evidence whatever. And it is completely untrue. I have every sympathy with the families of those who lose their lives in any circumstances. But it had nothing whatever to do with Britain. How significant were the changes in ownership in Irish newspapers? Two new proprietors during 1973. Hugh McLaughlin, who launched the Sunday World. A good newspaper is one, of course, that's published and is successful for a start off. It must be successful. Commercially successful. Commercially successful, first of all. And to have that, uh, you must have the people to buy it. And you must have people to advertise in it. And Tony O'Reilly, who bought William Martin Murphy's Old Empire, the independent newspaper group. And uh, I believe that the independent, in commercial terms, represents the finest media opportunity in Ireland. It's been said that you are a supporter of Fianna Fáil. Are you, in fact, a supporter of Fianna Fáil? I think I've heard it said that I've been a supporter of all three parties. I've never made it explicit what party I support. I support the democratic institutions of the state, full stop. Continuing inflation, rising food prices, was perhaps the question of most concern during 1973. Candless. They really are uncontrollable. I mean, no matter what shop you go into, one thing is here. And, you know, if you go down this week and you give so much for your groceries, and you come along and you go down next week, it's always dearer. We've heard of black power, we've heard of Indian power, we've heard of green power, we've heard of woman power. Let's leave here and show the country and the Cost of Living Council what pump power is. Whoever would have thought as the year opened that petrol pump attendants would be on the march, their own lobby in the United States during 1973. The impending energy crisis, accelerated by the Middle East war, this was and is an issue which affected countries throughout the world. We even don't have uh, the, the, the bicycles, you know, which we left somewhere in the cellar. People, there's a real buying spree now. Uh, my wife uh, used, uh, went out to buy a second bicycle for us. And uh, she told me that there was a queue of about 200 people in front of the bicycle shop. In terms of comfort, we shall have a harder Christmas than we have known since the war. In the civil service offices now, by direction of the minister, uh, the thermostat is set at 63 degrees, and I have no complaints from my own staff. How the news of war came to the Middle East, Israeli radio putting the country on a war footing. The country's foreign minister, Abba Eban, was angry when he went to the United Nations. The governments of Egypt and Syria simultaneously and together 
have performed two acts so base and vile that it is hard to find words adequate to their infamy. The first act is an act of treacherous aggression. The second, perhaps more heinous, is the crime of mendacity. The Israeli strategy was to hold the territory she had gained during the Six-Day War in 1967. But the map of the Middle East after this year's war has changed again. UN troops, as observers, including some from Ireland, are helping to keep the peace. Sporadic terrorism continues outside the Middle East from Palestinian groups. The Arab governments believe they have a more effective weapon, oil. The future of the area, as peace talks open in Geneva, the future of the area remains unpredictable. Comparative frugality in parts of Europe may have ensued from the loss of Middle East oil. For others in the world, in northern Ethiopia, there were more significant shortages. No water for some for the seventh year. Their menfolk in the night are stealing away by stealth because they're ashamed to face their families and see them die of drought and starvation in front of their eyes. Father Raymond Kennedy of the relief agency Concern, who toured the area twice. And therefore the families rush in to the roadside to get uh, food and, and water. And then when the little rain does fall, there's nobody at home to do the plowing. Besides, they have no seed to do the plowing. And then there's stock animals. Are, so many of them are dead. Among international developments, Peron returned to power in the Argentine. The Spanish premier was assassinated. Another change of government in Greece, another military takeover. Russian leader Mr. Brezhnev came to Washington. Let me say frankly that personally, I am also pleased that this visit has given me an opportunity to gain some first-hand impressions of America, to see some aspect of the American way of life. Despite the continuing Watergate scandal and the loss of credibility at home, President Nixon, through his ubiquitous Secretary of State, Dr. Henry Kissinger, further strengthened diplomatic contact with Peking. It was decided that the existing channel in Paris was inadequate and that, therefore, each side would establish a liaison office in the capital of the other. 1973 also witnessed a change of government in Chile, the overthrow and death of the world's first democratically elected Marxist, Salvador Allende. His ambassador in London commented. It was a, a social fight for more than 40 years in the line of absolute consequence with the interests of the Chilean working class and the Chilean people. Second, because it was uh, absolutely loyal as well to the program of the popular unity. And I am sure that uh, he will be remembered as one of uh, the Chilean most outstanding political figures uh, from the angle of the Chilean working class and the Chilean people. Another man who lost power in very different circumstances in 1973, U.S. Vice President Spiro Agnew. After hard deliberation and much prayer, I concluded that the public interest would best be served by my stepping down. An exit of another kind, William Whitelaw left Stormont Castle after 20 months as Secretary of State in Northern Ireland. And so we would say we have done our best. Some may not like it. I, of course, have made mistakes. But who in the troubled history of Ireland has not done so? Mr. Whitelaw made new friends in 1973. It brought an understanding personality, and it brought a real hard worker in Willie Whitelaw. And I'm grateful to the generosity of the things that Brian Faulkner said about me. I have some doubt if they are deserved, but I appreciate them all the more. Historical verdicts on Whitelaw's 20 months? I think there are times when our problem needs that type of man. But I think that in the ultimate, our problem will need the long-range thinker as well, the De Gaulle type figure. 1973 will perhaps be remembered as a year in Ireland dominated by politics. Power sharing came to Northern Ireland. A Council of Ireland was agreed. After the White Paper and the Assembly elections, Mr Whitelaw had persuaded the Alliance Party, the SDLP, and a part of the Unionist Party to share political power. As someone who has differed on fundamental political matters with other people for a great many years that I look forward to working closely and in harmony 
with Jerry Fitt, who will be my deputy on the new executive of government in Northern Ireland. I believe we have a good government. Tripartite talks, quintripartite talks in effect, were held at Sunningdale. A Council of Ireland was agreed. The Taoiseach, Liam Cosgrave, TD. In my opening statement to the conference, uh, I said what we now need in Ireland are, first, institutions to encourage trust and cooperation throughout the island. Second, effective measures to sustain and defend these institutions. Third, uh, acceptance of those institutions as a way of resolving old conflicts and easing present fears. As elected representatives, responding to the deeply felt wishes of the people we represent, we have worked out here at Sunningdale a settlement which, under God, could meet those needs and, and in addition, provide a new basis for understanding in Anglo-Irish relations. There are no winners and no losers here at Sunningdale today. Oliver Napier, leader of the Alliance Party, at the conclusion of the Sunningdale Conference, compared power sharing in Ireland with the post-war European experience. And you know, it's an odd thing when countries in Europe, countries 